markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Hey team, welcome to Chat with Traders 206. I'm Aaron Fifield, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you a special guest, Dan David. Dan is the founder of Wolfpack Research, a firm that goes to extreme measures to meticulously understand the business operations, technical aspects, and financials of listed companies. When uncovering a disconnect between what a company announces to the market and what Wolfpack deems to be the truth, the firm may build a short position in the company and publish their findings in a detailed research report. In other words, Dan's what is commonly regarded as an activist short seller. If you've seen the documentary, The China Hustle, then you'll already be well familiar with Dan. He was the lead protagonist throughout the film. If you've not seen it, then The China Hustle is a documentary about the key players, or rather activist shorts, who revealed egregious cases of fraud by Chinese companies that were listing on US markets through the process of a reverse merger. As you'll hear, Dan wasn't exactly thrilled with the outcome of the film, but regardless, it probably tops my list of favourite finance documentaries. You should definitely give it a watch because it's fascinating. I know it's on the Australian Netflix, I'm not sure about elsewhere. In speaking with Dan, we go over his precursor to investigating fraud and deception, performing research and methods of gathering information, dealing with risks inherent to short selling, and specific examples from various cases. Now this should probably go without saying, but the stocks mentioned in this episode, and any episode for that matter, are for the purpose of example only. As always, you are entirely responsible for your own trading decisions. I'm glad I was able to bring Dan on the show, and I think you'll find this chat very interesting. If so, then you may also be pleased to know Dan hosts a podcast of his own. It is called I Hung Up on Warren Buffett. (laughs) Ladies and gents, straight to it now. Here is Dan David. You know, I actually rewatched the China Hustle last night just to sort of refresh and um, do a little bit of prep for this. You know, it's probably my favorite finance documentary. I absolutely love it. I hate it. Why? Do you want to talk about that on the show? You want to talk about it now? Yeah, let's just go now. <laughs> uh, well, look, you know, when you live it, you know that there are, you know, very deep and rich stories that you can't fit in an hour and a half that weren't told. Uh, there were some real bad guys that, that were off the hook that weren't in the movie. There were some real good guys that didn't quite fit in the movie. Um, I hated the part about going back to Flint. That was a big fight that took months for them to get me to go agree to go back to Flint. And, um, they had to agree to interview my partner because they were, they were not putting him in the movie for some reason. Well, I know why they weren't putting him in it, but I I felt that was unfair because he was as big a part of this story as I was. And so they agreed to put him in the chair for three hours, spend that time and money, which is not insubstantial. And then I went back to Flint and they cut him out of the movie. (laughs) Dicks. The part about you going back to Flint, that was when you were sort of driving up and down the, the streets and all the abandoned houses. Well, that's exactly what I knew they would do. And I, and I told them, I don't want to go back to my hometown and you guys film bombed out Beirut because that's, that's not what Flint is. I mean, there, there's a part of that there that, of course, you can turn on the camera and, and, and show it, but there's also a very rich in culture part of Flint and resilience to the people that are there and we're tired of being shit on in, in every documentary or movie or, you know, we go from general motors screwing us for, you know, 20 years, uh, to a water crisis, to, 
uh, you know, whatever malady <laughs> you can think of. I mean, the seven plagues, and that's all people report on. But that's that's not who Flint, who Flint people are, and I'm 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 tired of it. So, how did you become involved in the documentary? Like, did did the filmmakers somehow discover you and come to you with the idea, or, or how does it, you know, like, how did the film come about? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I had lobbied Congress, which is part of the film, and what the film doesn't show is the, the couple of years prior to filming that I was, I was going down and educating members of Congress about this problem, and I didn't know that that's what I had to do. I thought that I would go to Congress and there would be smart people there. I was wrong. And they would hear about this problem and know what to do to fix it. And I went and talked to members of Congress. They were completely astounded by the fact that it's not illegal in China to steal from a U.S. citizen and that it happens unabated on our capital markets. And then they asked me what they should do about it. I'm like, what the fuck do you mean? What should we do about it? I can't, I came down to Congress. That's what I'm doing about it. That's what I thought my job was to do is to come report it. Now you're asking me how to fix it. What did we elect you for? Uh, that was my first year, which was, you know, concerning. And then my second year I thought, okay, well, you know, they want, they want some answers and some, some ideas of how to fix this. So I went back down there with some answers and some ideas of how to fix it. Uh, but that took political will. So they weren't really interested in that. And I was very frustrated. And John Carnes, who's in the documentary, uh, if you saw that, right. Mm -hmm. And Alfred little, he hit Alfred little, right. He was anonymous Alfred little, you know, in the beginning because he was in China. So it was very dangerous for him, but he had, as John Carnes in the years prior, uh, done a documentary called IOU USA. And it was predicting the financial collapse prior to 2008. Actually, I think the movie actually premiered in July of 2008, like two months before the collapse. And Warren Buffett was in the movie. And John knew Sarah Gibson, who was the, one, of, one of the producers of this movie, the one, the one who did all the work. I mean, you have a football team of producers, right? And there's like 12 of them and 10 don't do anything. But she did the work. And we called her and we financed the movie for the first year and a half with our own money. And we showed um, Alex Gibney and Frank Marshall. And Alex Gibney, of course, is, you know, with Jigsaw. Frank Marshall is, you know, Hollywood royalty, born identity and the Indiana Jones movies and all of that. And they, they both signed on. Then once they signed on, Mark Cuban bought the movie and he basically gave us all the money that we had put in for the year, right? Um, the year prior us producing it, we made nothing on it, just got paid back and we gave up all control at that point and they produced it. My original vision was not for me to be the lead protagonist. Uh, I thought Carson Block would have been much better at that. So how long was that process, like from when you started filming it to, like, like how long did the filming process take? It sounds like it went over a couple years. Well, we started working with it in 2015, and they took over in 2016 and then, of course, it premiered in 2018. So who were some of the people you kind of hinted earlier that there were some things left out which you would have loved to have seen in there, um, some particular characters? I mean, is that something you'd like to talk about here? Um, not without profanity. Go for but, it. I won't, I won't hold you back. <laughs> you, saw, you saw the movie, right? <laughs> I can uh, be profane. I've seen it twice, I, yeah. I, I, I uh, lack the vocabulary not to be. So, um, look, there were just some, some particularly capricious, you know, assholes that, I mean, th the fact is if you're not going to get in front of the camera and sit down and talk about your version of events, which everybody thinks they're the good guy, right? 
uh, everybody but me. You can't really be in the movie very much. And, you know, I thought, you know, Benjamin Way, who was under indictment at the time uh, and brought a lot of these companies here to the United States and made, you know, tens of millions, if not a hundred million dollars, bringing total shit to our market should have been front and center. Uh, Roth Capital played a, a very major role in the movie, but, you know, they were one of many investment banks. You had Global Hunter, you had Breen Murray, you had some of the bigger banks as well, like Goldman, Morgan Stanley, um, you know, uh, Merrill Lynch, all of them were involved in this to some degree. And, and then there was a political slant to it as well, right? Like, you know, you, you know, they had me going after, uh, Senator Pat Toomey, who, uh, unfortunately I refer to as a motherfucker in the movie. He has not forgotten that. <laughs> it wasn't smart of me for, to run for Congress the next year in his district, uh, <laughs> he was un unkind about it, but I don't care. He, I stand by it. He is, but they made Elizabeth Warren look, you know, kind of like she was there to help. But we, the fact of the matter is we contacted Elizabeth Warren seven or eight times from 2014 to 2018. She never even responded. So this was a bipartisan, I don't care. It wasn't a Republican, you know, uh, uh, kind of blow off. It was Democrats and Republicans blowing us off. And I felt like they, they slanted it that way, which was unfortunate. Okay. So prior to becoming the activist short seller, as you know, and today, like what were you doing prior? I understand you were still active in markets, but in a slightly different way. Well, I was actually an operator. I was high to mid-level executive in a jewelry company from 93 to 2006. And I decided to partner with my partner at Geo Investing. I'm no longer with them. As you know, I have my own firm, Wolfpack Research. He had many venture capital interests and me being an operator, uh, I ran the venture capital arm and he ran the investing arm uh, starting in 2006. And he was very successful. Like the fund was up 47% in 2006 and 49% in 2007. And then we get to 2008 and, you know, between October and November 2008, we're down 79%. And I was shell-shocked. And, and he was too. And at that point, I just decided that I was never going to let anybody control my money that way, my own personal money. And I was going to get more involved in the investing side of it, which happened in, you know, after the financial crisis 2008. And as I was understanding the business better, my, my partner, Maj, who was a value investor, you know, I, we basically agreed that this was a kind of a one-time event and a, an anomaly. So don't change the strategy of value investing long. And looking at the criteria that we would look at for that, that took us to China, which you would see companies that were projecting growth year over year of 100%. You know, um, earnings per share growth of, you know, around the same. And so we put 90% of what we had left into China-based U.S. listed securities. And we, we picked up like 179%. We, we got it all back within a year, investing long in China. So we thought, you know, we thought these companies are great. And, you know, we were going to the Roth Capital Conferences, the Rodman and Renshaw Conferences, and meeting with these CEOs, and, and and felt good about the stories. And then we saw Carson Block and Alfred Little and others start to publish reports saying that some of these companies that we, we had exited because they hit a price target uh, were frauds. And we thought, okay, well, we made a lot of money on these companies, and we got out of them because they hit the price target that we we were comfortable with not, we didn't get out of them because we thought they were frauds. So we better go check this out and figure out whether we were lucky or good. Cause if we were just lucky, we're going to end up broke again. And we hired our own investigators to go to China and look at 30 companies for, uh, you know, about a month or six weeks. And they came back and they said the short sellers are exaggerating the problem. Um, it, uh, it, they're under, 
estimating how big the fraud is. It's it's pervasive. It's everywhere. So they were wrong in that way that they weren't they weren't saying how big the fraud was. So we had a choice to make. We could either sweep that under the rug like like the investment banks did or many other companies did or blow the whistle. And the rest is kind of history. Yeah, you obviously picked the later option and started uh, speaking out about it. Sending some people to China to look into some of these companies, I mean, that's that's a pretty serious undertaking. Uh, you know, back then, it it wasn't such a big deal because, you know, fraud hadn't been really exposed. One or two companies, right? There were small microcap companies, no big deal to anybody. Um, it wasn't hugely expensive. I want to say we, you know, the first two companies we did were uh, $50,000, I'd say we, we put into, <laughs> we had one company was a cemetery company that uh, didn't own the cemetery. They said they did. They were uh, called China Redstone. And to prove they didn't own the cemetery, they said they did. We went and bought cemetery plots. And that still didn't convince people, believe it or not, back then, that they didn't own it. Uh, and then there was another company, Lotus Pharmaceuticals, that said they spent $31 million uh, buying land in Inner Mongolia. And we pulled the tax filings for that, that province. And the entire province raked in like $7 million in, in, in total revenue. So those two things didn't add up. And that's kind of what we came up with. And we published those two reports uh, without taking short positions. We didn't want to be short sellers. We thought, you know, that was a that was a different kind of outlook. We we didn't identify with short sellers at that time. We didn't quite understand it, and we published our research for for free. And we thought, look, if we if we tell the truth and we publish this research for free, people will come to our website. They'll be very appreciative that we're we're not taking a financial stake in these companies uh, to to fail, and uh, they'll buy our research. What ended up happening is they said, you know, you're short sellers anyway. If you're going to say something negative, you're a short seller. And so we just spent $50,000 and we made no money. From that point forward, we started shorting. So that was the turning point. Yeah, and about 2010. Okay. Now, the China Hustle film was uh, done a few years ago which obviously focused a lot on Chinese um, companies listed in the U.S. Is that still a big focus for you today, or have you kind of moved to a new area of the market? Um, I do both. Uh, there, there's plenty of fraud in the United States, uh, which is ridiculous because it, it, you look at, what was it, um, you know, um, who was it lately that just paid a fine for for a billion dollars for fraud? Which bank? But you know, it was Wells Fargo a couple of years ago. It's Morgan Stanley. It's all of these different banks pay these enormous fines for you know what what is essentially fraud on the capital markets, which I think is ridiculous because a bank cannot commit fraud, right? People at a bank commit fraud, but if the bank pays a fine, a huge fine nobody goes to jail and the people are not prosecuted. And so it's baked into the P&L. So we've, we, we've come to a place here in the United States where fraud is a fine, unless you're poor. If you're poor, then you know, fraud is still a, you know, a criminally prosecutable uh, event. But if you are a multinational corporation and there's fraud that's committed, then you can just pay a fine, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. I'd love to speak with you, Dan, about how you actually research some of these companies, like where the ideas even come from. You know, given there's thousands of companies listed on the US market, how does one initially appear on your radar? Well, I mean, look, there's there's a hundred different ways it can. Of course, you have, you know, the, the, the outlier screeners that say this company is – is way above in margins to their peers in the market, even in China, or they're they're just blowing out their revenue numbers, or companies that are 
just about to go bankrupt, but then have this wild event that saves them at the last minute. Those are the kind of things you look into. But really kind of where I am right now with, you know, being known in, in, in any kind of small way, uh, people reach out and say, hey, will you have a look at this company? And some of those are pretty good tips. Uh, sometimes people will send me their research. I think they hope I'll publish it. Uh, I've never done that. I'll look at their research, and if I can reproduce it on my own, and it and it comes out to be the same thing and true, I'll I'll publish it. But that's my own research because I reproduced it. So we get a lot of people that that reach out to us and say, "Hey, have a look at this company," and if they're a trusted source, even better. So, what are some of the first things you might? look at in an attempt to reproduce some of that research if it's coming from a tip or you know if it's one of the a company which has just come onto your radar from something you have observed like what's the preliminary research to decide if an idea is worth pursuing further well i think background of the executives matter right who's running the company and you know what's their history uh so we we have programs for that uh, to see what they're doing. And then we, you know, it's the, the comparison of peers, right? So, I mean, you, you either have found a new way to make a wheel or you haven't. And if you haven't, then how are you supposedly doing so much better than your peers in the market? Um, accounting is something we look at very strongly now because you have this, you know, this has really crept into the market over the last 20 years, but you know, this, this word adjusted, right? Adjusted um, earnings per share, adjusted um, uh, margins, adjusted. All adjusted means is a, a kind of set of parameters that management has put around what their earnings per share or their margin or their revenue is. And it's all bullshit, right? Your earnings per share or your earnings per share. And they they kind of match their bonus to whatever's their adjusted metrics, right? And what we're seeing now, and I think it's starting to kind of hit the zeitgeist, is everybody's taking these huge uh, payouts uh, from stock buybacks, right? And then they have these stock options, and they cash out hundreds of millions of dollars. And most of their bonuses are based on adjusted metrics, and I think that that kind of incentivizes management to, if not cross the line, really straddle the line of fraud or creative accounting or accounting shenanigans, whatever you want to call it, and really lever their companies to a, a position where any, any kind of change in the market could send it over the edge. So we look for that, something we did with GTT. Uh, last year, and we saw that all these adjusted metrics were paying management tens of millions of dollars, but it was levering the company to a position where they they could not sustain their roll-up strategy. And you look at where they are now is where we said they would be, you know, heading towards bankruptcy. So can you share a little more uh, details around that particular case? Yeah, I mean, GTT was a roll-up strategy, right? They're a telecommunications company that uh, bought smaller telecommunications company, rolled them up, integrated them, and they were successful for a while. I was actually a long shareholder in GTT, you know, maybe seven or eight years ago when that strategy was small. But when management starts to base their bonuses on, on acquisitions, and the bigger the acquisition, the bigger the bonus – they had made two acquisitions, Hibernia and Interout, uh, in subsequent years that more than doubled the size of their company. And while management got paid tens of millions of dollars in options and bonuses, it levered the company to the point to uh, integration not going as you know flawlessly, right? Uh, that they could no longer service their debt. And we're seeing this more and more. And if you look at interest rates, right, they can't go up. If interest rates go up in any kind of substantive way, 
which they should, that would be healthy for our economy, uh, there would be, I mean, hundreds of companies on our market that would be bankrupt within six months. Not to mention that our government couldn't service our debt. So we've got that problem as well. We, uh, we at this point, pay almost as much in debt service at these historic low interest rates uh, uh, for our, our annual budget for the government as we do for our military, like $700 billion. If that interest rate was 4 or 5%, you'd be talking about a trillion dollars in interest alone on our debt. So at what point did GTT become a screaming short? When they bought in a route. At that point, they overpaid for them uh, $2.1, $2.3 billion, something like that. They, there was a bidding war for in a, uh, in a route, and they were well above the next competitor. And they just really weren't worth that. And then you start to see that their you know, intangible assets, uh, they're, they're marking them up. And, you know, it's, uh, everything is getting spread out and they're, and they're, you know, uh, deferred revenue and things of that nature. Um, and they just, we knew that they weren't going to be able to bring in the amount of revenue they needed to service their debt after in or out. To get your head around this sort of thing, I mean, it seems very complex. Like it would take a really deep understanding of the company, of how exactly how all their finances work and that type of thing. You know, like you're mm-hmm. kind of doing forensic accounting. I'm not really sure what I'm trying to ask here, but it's like, yeah, there's a lot of work that must go into that. It's an amazing amount of work that long shareholders do not have to do. Right. So if you're, if you are long a company and you have a positive view that is wrong, then you were just overly optimistic. Uh, If you have a negative view that's wrong on the short side, then people think you're committing fraud or you're some kind of short selling cabal. It's ridiculous. We spend months and sometimes years looking at a company quarter after quarter, seeing the trend. Uh, seeing how their accounting treatments change, right? Do they do they start to revalue their intangible assets and things of that nature? So it's it's very difficult. We do we have a better understanding of a company before we actually kind of publish a short thesis than the auditors do, and they have access to the management. I guess one part of it is kind of like the forensic accounting aspect, but then there's also the the need to actually understand what that company does like on a on a technical level how do you gather information around that being a customer helps so if you want to understand what a what a company does you you have to be serviced by that company or uh, if you can't be a customer talk to a customer and and understand what their relationship is with that company so we, we do get into supply chain. We do get into uh, their customers. I mean, sometimes we find, like you know, especially if it's China related, that that customer doesn't exist, or that's a a related party, a brother or sister, and it's round tripping uh, uh, revenue. But that that definitely helps. And I think people, investors don't really realize that when they're valuing a company, they'll talk to management. They'll talk to the CFO, the CEO, and and will feel however they feel about that conversation when they're done. But they would probably have a better understanding if they then talk to their top two or three customers, and they should be able to do that. Um, or supplier. Why wouldn't they be able to talk to their suppliers as well, find their one, two, or three top suppliers, and 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 see how that supplier feels about their customer, uh, about that relationship. Can you think of any specific examples, you know, in an attempt to gather information, like some of the great lengths you've gone to, to, to get such information? I mean, sending a, a team or a few people over to China uh, is obviously a good example of that. Are there, is there anything else you've done, you know, maybe within the US, which is, you know, going to be interesting for people to hear about? Well, I mean, we, 
We also interview former employees, and there's a network service for that that you can you can subscribe to. And you know, former employees that you know maybe aren't under an NDA can talk to you about the company. Or you know, there are times where you you kind of pose as a potential customer, and you just call them up and tell me about your service. And um, the, we we did that with GTT actually, and we've done that with with other companies. Inspire, we you know talk to them and we talk to some of their uh, customers. And you know, before we we get a view on that, we want to understand kind of a 360 angle. So there is no angle, right? You've got a 360 view. Um, we pretty much do that with everybody. Uh, QTT, which we did in, in China as well, was kind of the same thing, right? We talked to their suppliers, their customers, and we found out that their suppliers and their customers were all related parties. What are some of, what's maybe one of the most shocking things which you have uncovered? <laughs> That's always going to take you back to China, right? So, <laughs> That, you know, somebody says they have a factory and that it's robust and that it's, it's running, you know, 365 days a year and three shifts a day and it's not running at all. And when they have investors coming out to, to see the factory, you'll notice if we, we put time-lapse surveillance on these factories uh, from a distance, we'll see, you know, lights come on one day. And next day, smokestacks, you know, smoke starts coming out of the smokestacks and what's going on here. And people are milling around the facility now where it was completely empty. And sure enough, a busload of investors show up, get off the bus, check out the factory. And, you know, I'm sure that looks like a great dog and pony show for them. They get on the bus and they leave and everything gets shut down. <laughs> it's a total Potemkin village. Yeah, that that part was in the documentary. It was just absolutely incredible. Yeah. I mean, you know, what people don't realize there are so many logistical challenges. I mean, I've had cameras, uh, lens of cameras pecked out by chickens, eaten <laughs> by a goat, <laughs> that goat, uh, unbelievable. They will eat anything. Um, <laughs> you, we, you know, sometimes we have to put them in less conspicuous places where people would see them. So you have to make them look, you know, obvious, like they belong there. If you put them on a telephone pole or something, uh, and you got to put something on the, on the device itself in a case that says, don't touch this. It will shock you. <laughs> and you'll see people's face get really kind of close to the camera and then they read that they can be shocked and then they'll jump back. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> funny. That's a clever tactic. Before you release a report, do you attempt to speak with management? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I, I prided myself on that. And other short sellers, some, some that were in the movie, always said, that's ridiculous. I mean, if you know they're committing fraud, what are they going to say to you? But I felt like that was really the appropriate thing to do. Uh, and talking about CGA, China Green Agriculture, uh, at one point I knew their biggest investor and he knew me and I said, look, you know, we should talk to management about what we've seen there. And it was time-lapse surveillance. It was obvious fraud. This was the, the one in the documentary where we had the tea salesman that went to the gate guard and said, you know, because they said they had hundreds of employees there. Right. And this tea salesman goes to the gate guard and says, Hey, we have these samples of tea. And we'd like all of your employees to try them. How many samples should I leave that would cover all of your employees? And he's like 50. So, okay, they don't have 500 employees. Uh, and I, I contact this lead investor. And he, of course, is like, you know, ready to shoot himself in the head. Because he owns a lot of stock he can't get out of. And I said, look, I'm willing to talk it out with management. Let's, let's see what they have to say. And if. If they've done something that's inappropriate here, let's disclose it, let them disclose it, and, and fix it. And, you know, all investors will be better off for it. So he sets up a call with management for, I think it was 9.45 in the morning on a particular day. Uh, or, it was, no, it was 10 a.m. in the morning on a particular day. And at 9.45 that morning, they put out a press release saying they just signed a deal with Nestle. <laughs> 
uh, and their revenue was going to quadruple, which was all a lie. And I had a, a fully baked short position at that time. And the stock goes up 100%. And my computer starts making sounds at me like I didn't know it could make. It just <laughs> bells and whistles and alarms. I mean, um, positions like closing out on me. And that's, and that's what happened. So that's what can happen when you're dealing with a fraud. They can say anything, right? They're already a fraud. So, you know, the truth is the more and more I look at it, management speaks to the market four or five times a year. If you talk about a Q or a K um, or, you know, an AK that they put out that a press release, they speak to the market all the time. So I've already really kind of spoken to them in what they've said in their K or their Qs. Uh, and for me to call up management at this point and say, yeah, Dan, David would like to speak to you. I end up with the dumbest PR guy in the world flanked by the 10 smartest lawyers in the company. What do you think I get out of that conversation? Right, right. Can you talk through the timeline of events kind of from when Wolfpack becomes convinced of a company is involved in fraud to putting on an actual short position and then actually releasing the report? Like how does... How does that timeline look? Well, it's situational. I mean, how liquid is the company? How big is the company? You can't. You, you generally don't want to be more than 5 or 10% of the trading in a day. You don't, you know, you can't buy too many puts or that 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 is a certain alarm to the mar market. So it's very situational. If it's a very liquid company, then that doesn't much matter. Uh, but if it isn't, then it, it's definitely a process that, you know, can be quite dangerous leading up to that report. So you often will sort of put on a position over a few days or maybe a few weeks prior to releasing the report? Correct. Okay. And once you've got on sort of enough size, I mean, how long before you release the report. I mean, I guess that's really what I'm quite interested in is how do you actually release the report? Because obviously when you put it out there, it's in your best interest to get, you know, maximum impact from that. So what's your process for putting a report out? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I can go on television. I mean, I, I don't know that everybody can do that, but if I if I need to go on CNBC or I need to go on Bloomberg, I can do that, uh, and that's pretty impactful. Uh, though some of these networks have been a little more, they're, they're getting a lot of pushback from companies, right, that you shouldn't allow people to come on and say negative things like Carson or myself, which is part of the reason why we have our own podcast now, uh, and we're building out that network, and, and Carson has has developed what he's called Zero's TV, his own television kind of network uh, that we're able to increase the megaphone for, for our speech. And I think we're seeing this in a lot of different areas you know, of politics, right? A, a, a fight against freedom of speech. Uh, so it's gotten more and more difficult. Uh, if you're in a, an anonymous person or an unknown person, it's got to be very difficult for you. Uh, but for myself, I'm, you know, I'm well followed enough that if I kind of put out a report and put it on my website, even if I don't go on television, it's pretty well followed. Yeah. What about um, like presentations and that type of thing? I know there was one part in the film where you, I think you actually went to China and gave a presentation to Chinese investors over there. Um, and I remember watching the, uh, the documentary on uh, Bill Ackman and his uh, Herbalife short. He kind of went on this big road show giving uh, presentations for reasons why he was short Herbalife. Um, I mean, is that something you do as well or is it a case by case still? Uh, I, you know, I will do that, um, uh, you know, on a case by case basis. I, you know, I certainly don't do it like Bill Ackman. Um, you know, there's quite a bit of hubris involved in that. I mean, you know, here's a guy that was completely right about Herbalife and could not have fucked it up 
in any bigger way, not the least of which, you know, uh, Carl Icahn was holding a grudge right. 10 years old. <laughs> and, and I think Icahn was like, uh, do I care if I die with $14 billion or $12 billion <laughs> and stick it up Ackman's ass? <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Uh, you know, for, for me, uh, yeah, I was in Hong Kong. I wasn't in China. I'm, you know, I, I cannot go uh, to China. Of course, yeah. And I can't go to Hong Kong anymore anymore because that's China. So there you go. But back when it was still two systems and, the, you know, I think I was the first uh, short seller to actually do uh, a short report live on stage at Sone in Hong Kong. I think that was 2015. There have been some since. I don't think there will be any more now. Uh, but that that's a good venue to do it. Jim Chanos does it at Sone here in New York. Carson Block has done it as well. Um, we, we're, we're testing different mediums. Um, the podcast, uh, I've also done video like, I, you know, Davey Day Trader. He and I got into it a few months ago, uh, mainly because he's a douchebag and he doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, and he was, he was having people buy micro caps that he had no understanding of. And, you know, he, he has him and his 18 million followers or whatever buying a micro cap. And he's like, wow, look how much this is going up. Yeah, asshole, it's a micro cap. If all you people buy it, it's going to go up in a day and it's going to come crashing down, which is exactly what happened to Mark. And I did a video presentation on that. Um, so we're, we're doing a little more, we're, we're testing the medium a little more because I feel like our reports, I mean, I guess I felt like at one time people would read our introduction, our bullet points and the conclusion if they didn't read the middle parts. And I'm not even sure they do that anymore. So the more you can do a visual medium, I think the better for the markets, especially the retail market. Do you normally expect a response from the company or from management once you actually put out a report? Oh, I haven't been sued all week. So you know, <laughs> it's, is it Wednesday, Tuesday. So um, you're doing yeah, well then. <laughs> I, yeah, right. Uh, I, I generally there's the, the more fraudulent a company is, the more likely they are to sue, uh, because they're just trying to push back the timeline and, and be able to get out of the position. The more legitimate companies will, you know, um, look into allegations, maybe have some semblance of, uh, an independent board of directors though. That's a very rare thing these days, which is the death of corporate governance. We don't, we don't have anything resembling corporate governance in the United States these days. They have none of it in China at all. Uh, and people don't even really realize that the board of directors are really supposed to be there on behalf of the shareholder. It's a joke. They're, they're there on behalf of themselves and management at this point, which is really hurt, hurting the capitalist kind of market. Uh, so I do expect a response the response is generally driven by how much did the stock go down, right? If the stock went down, you know, 10% or more, they're going to respond. If it didn't go down at all, they're probably going to ignore it. Okay. Let's say the stock doesn't really go down. Um, or maybe even if you do get a response from management because the stock did go down, is it part of your strategy to release follow-up reports like, will you sometimes withhold some of the information that you've uncovered or gathered on a company um, and save that for a follow-up report? Yes. Yeah, we do. Uh, especially for fraudulent companies. I remember the uh, first lawsuit we had back in 2012, Sound of Clean Energy. We had three cameras on the facility. And they were total fraud. Uh, they, they had this revolutionary way of producing um, energy, coal slurry. And their barrier to entry in the market was, was huge, right? You take coal, you crush it, you mix it with water. Uh, okay, everybody can do that. So there was no barrier to entry. And their facilities were often not running. But as soon as we published our report, they sued us. So we had three cameras on the facility. The day we were served with our complaint that they were going to sue us, we set up seven more cameras. And that's what you do. 
you always be on offense. The minute you go on defense, you lose. I mean, uh, if you, I mean, here in the United States, football is a, is a big thing for us, right? And we have what's called a prevent defense, which means you're prevent, trying to protect a lead. But in my experience, a prevent defense only prevents you from winning. You go on offense. If you're right and you have the truth behind you, go find more truth. How do you avoid, or avoid's probably not the right word here, how do you avoid getting sued for defamation? Like you've said, you know, you put out a report on this company, they tried to sue you the next day. Um, I'm not sure if that was successful or not, but I mean, how it's do never you... never been successful. Be clear about that. Nobody's ever won. Okay. So how, how come they haven't won? Like how do you, how are you protected from being sued for defamation? I have the three things you need to win all defamation lawsuits. Money, the truth, and money. <laughs> I mean, that's just, it's that simple. So you be very, very clear that you're telling the truth. And we are laborious about every word we're printing, right? And we're publishing. We, we go through dozens of drafts before there's a final draft. Is this the right word? And we often say, believe it or not, is this fair to the company? Because again, a company cannot commit fraud. And when I say fair to the company, I mean fair to the investors in the company. You don't want to be unfair to them because we're really alleging that management is committing fraud, not the company. And so we, we're very careful about that. And before I use the F word, the fraud word, in a report, I have to be very, very careful confident that it is fraud and not a material misrepresentation because if it's a material misrepresentation then then that's what you should call it and there's some short sellers out there and this just drives me nuts that are like i have to say fraud you know 15 times in the first paragraph i think that's ridiculous that's that's crazy you just you have to tell a story in a way that is truthful and impactful uh and that people can understand and that's, and you don't really worry about the consequences at that point because you're telling the truth. When you are short a company, what's the ideal scenario that you are hoping for? I mean, I presume it's probably unrealistic to think that every company you short, uh, you're going to ride to zero and it's going to go into administration. Uh, I think you may often have a target price on your reports, or I know that's, that's fairly common practice amongst some short sellers. No, I don't do that. You don't have a target price. So so what's the what are you hoping for? Like what's the ideal outcome when you do short a company? Obviously the price goes down, but how much? <laughs> well, I don't know about how much. There's a fair value on the company at that, you know. I mean, that's what I'm looking for, a fair value on the company. Uh I, I you know, ideally I don't want to see shareholders wiped out. I mean, you know, when we've you know, we've had occasion to sh- you know put out a report and a company just absolutely craters, right? And and we've made a lot of money. And you'd think that everybody runs around the office giving each other high fives. And that's what you can do when it's a long report, right? Because a rising tide lifts all boats. Everybody made money, including investors. But when we do that and a company craters, people lost money. Innocent people lost money. Investors, our neighbors, our family. They lost money. So, you know, we don't, we don't run around the office giving each other high fives and celebrating. You know, I'm hoping that there's some accountability uh, for management or the people that caused this loss. We didn't cause a company to lose money. They did. We simply exposed more light, more truth to what is happening in this company. So people might think that we caused it, but we didn't. Management caused it. So let's talk about when the opposite happens. Like when you put out a report and the stock price just continues to go higher. Um, When we first got on the- That's my favorite. (laughs) When we first got on the- I wake up every morning hoping I lose money. (laughs) How wonderful is that? But how do you manage risk on these- 
on these uh, short trades or short investments. Um, because, I mean, you mentioned, and I'm, I can appreciate this is probably a bit of a sensitive topic right now, but uh, INSP, uh, when we first got on the call, you had mentioned that it's now tripled in price since the release of your report. I mean, how do you manage a position like that? Do you, do you start scaling it back? Do you have a particular price where you're just going to admit that maybe you were wrong on this or like, how do you, how do you treat that? Well, yeah, we're not wrong on ISP, (laughs) but you know, as far as an investment thesis goes, you're only right when the rest of the market agrees with you and you're short. So, you know, in the, in this situation, yeah, you, you have hedges and, and you have, you have a squeal point, right? And you have to manage that risk. I mean, with none of these, am I ever like, hey, we're going to put 80% of our entire portfolio in this in this trade. Uh, and with INSP, we initially, you know, made money. So we're, we're profitable in that trade. And generally, you kind of keep that profit and, and let that ride in the market, which is, you know, obviously in this case, deteriorated into at least a paper loss. Uh, but we're confident in that position. Um, you know, it's trading right now. It's something like 40 or 45 times trailing 12 months revenue, right? You can't even talk about trailing 12 months profit or earnings per share because they have no profit and they never will. Uh, so looking at 45 times revenue for a loss making company and it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's where the markets are right now with the kind of liquidity that our government is throwing at the markets. It, you have to kind of expect some of this to happen. But if you're thinking about this notionally, right? I mean, you've got somebody that, if, you, if it's a private enterprise, they have a business that they take in a uh, million dollars a year in revenue, but that costs them $200,000 a year to get that million dollars. So they're, it's a loss-making business. And somebody comes to them and says, I'll give you $45 million for that business. That never happens. But in the stock market, it does happen, right? Because they're trading it 45 times trailing 12 months revenue. How long can that continue? I guess that continues until the market starts to turn and profitability matters again. But to answer your question, you, you manage that risk on a daily basis. And there are times where that can be a grind. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with it. I don't think anybody feels sorry for a short seller. And I don't really care that they do or they don't. You uh, are either good at what you do or you're not. And if you're not, you're not in it very long. Yeah. I guess another part, uh, you know, speaking about risk here is like reputation risk. How do you feel around that? Obviously, when you put out a report, your your reputation is riding on that, right? I mean, to some degree, I suppose it is. I mean, I, I do care about that. The The reputation risk that I care about is, am I telling the truth? That's what I care about. So, and if you go back and look at that report, we're objectively correct and and telling the truth. And when I mean, you look at this device, right, it's, you know, to, to help you with snoring, they will, you know, carve out a hole in your chest and put a device in there and attach it to your hypoglossal nerve, which you need for small things like swallowing, chewing, smiling. Uh, and a lot of things can go wrong with that, like nicking the juggler and things of that nature. So it's it's not a... They, they say it's not an invasive surgery. It actually is. And there are other devices that you can use like a mouthpiece and, and you might go back to a CPAP, which is, you know, pretty important. But what we think, what we think INSP is doing is, is really not telling the truth about the TAM and the total addressable market is nowhere near what they say it is. And it's very obstructed in, in finding that information. So eventually eventually the market will correct it. It's, you know, whether I'm holding a position or not at the time is immaterial. Uh, It's, it's not going to continue. You're not going to trade like that, but you know, reputationally, you know, you take a few hits from people saying, Hey, this, you know, this didn't, you know, you were wrong about this. Well, actually I wasn't wrong about it, but if your point is that that's not a money-making trade, I, I get your point, but I was telling the truth and that's what matters to me. We often hear the term 
evil short seller being thrown around. What are some of the common criticisms that you face as an activist short seller and, and how do you address those? I don't really in general anymore. I mean, I guess the first few death threats I got meant something. <laughs> uh, you know, the first time somebody sends you a picture of your house blowing up or whatever, I mean, what are you going to do? Uh, it's that's happened. Sure. Oh, of course. Hey, come on. Have you been on Twitter? Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, the anonymity, you know, it's, it's interesting because people like decry the anonymity, uh, of, of short sellers, right. That they, they don't put their name on the report and they anonymously criticize a company. I've never done that, but I, I appreciate the right of somebody to do that. They might have a day job. They might, they might work at a fund that's long only. And if they know, you know, you have a short seller working there, they won't talk to you. There's a whole lot of reasons why you would do that. But on, on the other side of it, you've got these anonymous people on Twitter or elsewhere that are just unabated and like how evil they are. I mean, they're just horrible. You know, if they're not misogynist, they're, they're, you know, they're, racist they're you know they'll say anything and you just believe it or not you get used to it it's fine whatever am i right that's that's what i go back to i go back and look at it are we right are we doing the right thing if somebody wants to and this has happened in several cases contact us you know back when you could maybe call me when you know i was at geo investing and had an office you could call if somebody's reasonable i would talk to them I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, if they're not going to be reasonable, then no sense in discussing it. Uh, Dan, I know you're on holiday, so I won't keep you too much longer. One thing I did want to ask you about before you run away, though, is uh, your podcast. Uh, so you've just started this recently, I think. Uh, the title is I Hung Up on Warren Buffett, which I think is hilarious. Um, <laughs> what's the story behind the title? I Hung Up on Warren Buffett. What's the story? <laughs> Just that simple. <laughs> I, you know what? I don't really talk about the the story itself. Uh, it's I, you know, I did. Um, it was it was for good reason, uh, and it was the it was the the best thing I could do in that moment. Um, I think he's a good man. I think he does great things for the market, um, and you know, I cherish him as an individual. Uh, but it's it's funny in our community. Uh, to to many of the other short sellers and, and and elsewhere, like they're like, oh my god, you hung up on Warren Buffett. So, I don't know. It's kind of clickbait, right? You know, to have that title, but it's also happens to be factually true. So I guess I can use it. <laughs> uh, and we're we're doing a variety of things. We're 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 talking about the market in general. We did an election day special on Friday that we published on on Monday about what we think the market would do yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Uh, we did a special on, uh, Nicola, uh, we weren't involved in that short, but we, we talked about what we thought was going to happen, uh, you know, with a DOJ investigation prior to that being announced and, and what the stock would do. I had Carson as a guest for that show. And then we do some politics. I actually interviewed Steve Bannon for three hours. And I think, I think we have him on for like two and a half hours, uh, after editing and my rule was, look, I'm not going to judge you and we're not going to just sit here and talk politics. I want to know who you are. What informs you as an individual? You know, how did you grow up? And, you know, you find out that this guy was, you know, in, in, him and his family were huge Kennedy supporters, uh, both John F. Kennedy and, and Bobby and Martin Luther King supporters. And they were Democrats. Uh, and how he was involved in the Iranian hostage crisis as a naval officer and working in the Carter administration. So there's some deeply rich information in some of the podcasts that we do that aren't necessarily what you would like Noah Steve Bannon for, where he gets on CN, uh, um, CNN or, or Fox and just machine gun fire for 10 minutes, right? It's the same shit over and over again. Um, and, you know, we're, we're looking to have a Michael Moore on to be the other side of it. And, you know, Michael and I are both from Flint, Michigan, so maybe we can talk about that. Uh, and it's having engaging conversations about finance and interesting people. And I'll put, I'll be putting my reports out on the podcast as well. 
Yeah, nice. I actually started listening to the episode with uh, Alfred Little uh, as I was walking to the gym last night. It was really fascinating. That guy seems like just a total badass. Um, I'm going to continue listening to that episode uh, today. You'd, you'd have to know that, Al, that John Carnes, Alfred Little, right, um, is the most unassuming short seller out there. He's the most unique short seller out there. He has zero ego at all. As you may have caught on, like, you know, these amazing things that he's done in his life, you you won't even hear about them unless they come up in conversation, right? Like, you know, acing his SATs or, you know, owning owning mines when he's being wadeered in an investigation about, you know, what do you know about mines? Well, I own them. <laughs> uh, or, you know, uh, pharmacies and things of that nature that he owned. And then, of course, the... Uh, the living in China and being on the long side of bringing these companies public and then switching to the short side. He's a fascinating individual. We have Soren Anandal coming on this Friday, who's a short seller, uh, Blue Orca. He was, he was actually in the movie, right? Yeah, he's short. Uh, I'm in Australia, so I trade ASX and um, he put out a short report on uh, Seek last, uh, last week. So we're sort of watching that uncover at the moment, unfold. Yes, yeah, Soren is a great guy, and he has a he has a richly fascinating story as well. Of, and I talk to these guys about how they grew up and and what informs them and how they became who they became, and and Soren's a very particularly interesting story, that his his family uh, were China missionaries, uh, so they knew that whole Asia Pacific area prior to Soren ever being involved in this, and of course. He was a he was a lawyer uh, before he became involved in, uh, in in the short selling side of it. So he's got that kind of background as well that he talks about. And he was actually on the Enron task force task force as a uh, as an intern. So that was pretty interesting that he talked about that as well. Yeah, full on. Yeah, I'll be listening. Uh, I'll be listening for sure. Where is the best place to listen to that? I guess it's just available on all the streaming platforms. Yeah. Yeah, it's oh, it's the Wolf Den, Wolfpack Research. Of course, I hung up on Warren Buffett is is the title of all of them, and then um, depending on who the guest is, uh, they'll come into the Wolf Den and and we'll talk to them. And I think one of the interesting things we do is we we stream it, uh, so when we're talking to them, we can see them and they can see us, and I think that adds to the conversation a bit. Uh, we don't actually publish the streaming part of it, but. I think you feel the intimacy that we end up having in that podcast because of it. Right, right. Okay. And you have co-hosts with you as well? Just the Wolf, the Wolfpack, you know, the people who work for uh, Wolfpack Research. Okay. Um, are joining, because I think, you know, it's interesting to have, uh, you know, my lead analyst is on there, um, you know, our, our engineers in the room anyway. So, you know, call it like Fred from the Howard Stern show, right? Every once in a while, they'll ask an inappropriate question and, <laughs> we will yell at him. <laughs> uh, we try to make it as, as, as real and rich and humorous as possible. Okay. Uh, Dan, if someone wants to follow you on Twitter, uh, would you like to give out your Twitter handle and maybe just share the, the Wolfpack website where um, someone can find out a little bit more info about yourself and what you do? Yeah, our Twitter handle is at Wolfpack Reports. Uh, and our website is wolfpackresearch.com. Excellent. All right, Dan, let's leave it there. And, you know, I'd absolutely love to have you back at some point. This has been fascinating. I think you're actually the first activist short I've had on the podcast. You know, I've done over 200 episodes now. Long overdue, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, really appreciate it. And thanks for making the time. I know you're on holiday. So, uh, yeah, means a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.